My non-birding friends often marvel at my ability to identify birds at a distance, in flight, or hopping in a bush. Invariably, they'll say something like, how do you know that? It just looks like a speck to me. Or, your vision is obviously way better than mine. I can hardly tell that was a bird. Now, while this all might be flattering to my birding ego, I'm definitely nobody special in the exciting world of birding identification. But I've learned through many hours in the field the subtle and sometimes not so subtle ways to identify birds. We do this all the time unconsciously with people we know. For example, I can pick out my wife walking away from me in the distance in a crowded shopping mall. There are both obvious and not so obvious clues that lead me to my conclusion. Her blonde hair is an obvious piece of the puzzle and her distinctive clothing is another. These are basic ID tools like size, color and shape that we've already covered in previous lectures. But the way she walks might not be so apparent to anybody else trying to identify her. And the particular manner in which she flicks her hair is something that is unique to her and helps me separate her from other people in the mall. It's only because I have spent so much time with her that I recognize these subtle behaviors. And of course, there are times when I tap my blonde wife on the shoulder and say, hey, hot stuff, only to be shocked to see her good friend turning around to face me. You see, even the very best birders get it wrong from time to time. So don't get disheartened when you make an incorrect ID. It happens frequently. And making false IDs is the best way to learn. In my example, I use a suite of ID tools subconsciously to identify my wife. Birding is the same way. We need to use a combination of basic ID tools and advanced ID tools to really become accomplished birders. Now we can use a field guide to assist us in basic bird identification. In other words, a field guide provides us with a good blueprint from which to work. But a field guide, no matter how good it is, struggles to convey the motion, behavior, or flight of birds in the same way observing bird behavior can. So in this lecture, we're going to focus on bird behavior. And my goal is a simple one. I want to demonstrate how a well-rounded knowledge of behavior can help you become a better birder. Okay, so what exactly is bird behavior? Bird behavior is often referred to as bird habits. The habits of birds vary just as much as their color, size, and shape, and can be a very useful aid in bird identification. When you're out in the field observing a bird, you should ask yourself continually what the bird is doing. Its behavior will often give telltale clues about its identity. Now, because the range of behavioral differences can be so vast, it's helpful to organize bird behavior into six broad categories. Typical behavior, feeding behavior, flight behavior, flocking behavior, mating behavior, and lastly, nesting behavior. Let's delve into each one of these categories and explore how these habits might aid you in bird identification. First up, is typical behavior. It includes the individual quirks that a bird has that separate it from other birds. Remember what I said about my wife's distinctive walk? Well, this is what we're talking about here. These are the habitual movements that a bird does constantly and not just while engaging in other behavior like feeding or flying. Once you spend a lot of time in the field, these individual quirks and subtleties will become apparent. And of course, many of these can be learned from other more experienced birders, which is why I encourage you to spend as much time as possible in the field with local experts. Let's look at a few examples of how typical behavior can assist in bird identification. Shorebirds are a broad group of birds that can present extremely tough ID challenges especially when they are out of breeding plumage. But the way that a sandling runs along the shoreline, hugging the waves, is totally unique. 
and their legs are nothing but a blur of motion. Even if it's amongst other similar birds, like semi-palmated sandpipers, the way that it runs is totally distinctive. Another shorebird, the spotted sandpiper, can be identified immediately by its constant tail bobbing and unusual teetering walking style. And once you learn this, you will never need to look at any other detail of the bird, like color or shape. Tail bobbing, as in the spotted sandpiper, is a form of typical behavior that is unique to only a handful of birds, like water thrushes, phoebes, and a few sparrows and warblers. Warblers, like shorebirds, can sometimes present a serious ID challenge to new birders. But I know that both prairie and palm warblers, unlike the majority of other warbler species, bob their tails incessantly. Water thrushes, of which there are two species in the United States, can also be easily identifiable by the fact that they're constantly bobbing their tails. But the way that they bob their tails can sometimes be different between two species. And herein lies the key to using typical behavior to separate two very similar birds, the northern water thrush and the Louisiana water thrush. At first glance, even for experienced birders, it's almost impossible to tell the two apart. But if you watch the way they bob their tails, you'll notice that the northern species bobs its tail straight up and down in a continuous manner. The Louisiana species tends to bob its tail slower and in an almost circular manner instead of straight up and down. Besides tail bobbing, the amount of activity that a bird exhibits can also give away clues. Vireos can often be hard to tell apart from warblers, but the former tend to move much slower and don't flit actively and constantly like the warblers. So that gives you a taste of our first category of behavior, typical behavior. Now let's turn to feeding behavior, which can be used on two levels to assist with the identification of birds in the field. At the macro level, a bird's feeding behavior can assist in categorizing a particular species into a particular family or order. For example, a bird clinging to a tree and drumming its bill against it's almost certainly going to be a woodpecker. At the macro level, feeding behavior can also be used to narrow a larger group into a smaller grouping that can aid further in identification. Imagine you see some birds on a lake that have flattened bills. By their size and shape, and the fact that they're sitting on water, you know them to be ducks. But then you notice that the birds are diving, and that they disappear for quite long periods of time between surfacing. Just by noticing this feeding behavior, you know that the ducks you are looking at belong to the diving ducks, rather than the dabbling ducks. You know this, because dabbling ducks forage in shallow water, upending themselves, sure, but never totally submerging themselves the way that diving ducks do. At the micro level, a bird's feeding behavior can be entirely distinct from any other bird in its family or order. Take, for example, the obvious case of the amazing American Dipper, the only songbird in North America that completely submerges itself when hunting for its food. With its habitats along the streams of the American West, this bird quickly ducks into the water to feed on aquatic insects and other invertebrates. Feeding behavior can also be useful when you're observing shorebirds, which as I've noted, are a real identification challenge for all birders, new and experienced. Two particular species that can often be found feeding together are stilt sandpipers and long-billed dowitchers. At first glance, these two species superficially resemble each other. They're both similar in size, and they both have long black bills, and they also have very similar color for the most part. But if you watch the way that they feed, you will notice that the stilt sandpipers because their bills are shorter than the dowitchers and their legs longer, have to tilt down further to probe in the mud. 
Their tails, therefore, are more elevated than that of the Dowichers. The stilt sandpipers resemble speeded up land oil rigs plumbing for oil with their tails sticking up in the air. The Dowichers, on the other hand, feed in a more parallel fashion and work their bills much like a sewing machine, probing the mud in quick short bursts. Still working at the micro level, the wading birds, otherwise known as the egrets and herons, provide us with another great example. The feeding behavior of these birds can easily be used to aid in identification without the need for additional characteristics. This is particularly relevant because many different species of these egrets and herons can be entirely white in color. Snowy egrets, cattle egrets, and great egrets are always white. Little blue herons are white as juveniles, and reddish egrets can quite commonly be seen as white morphs. Morph is just another word for a different variety or color. Even great blue herons have a very rare white form, otherwise known as Werdemann's heron. Now it's true that size and certain other physical features can readily be used to distinguish between these different species. But behavior can be even more useful, especially when the birds are at a distance. For example, cattle egrets, unlike all the other wading bird species, seldom feed in water and are most often seen in fields, feeding on insects disturbed by large animals or tractors, hence their name. Reddish egrets are the most active of all the wading birds. Their constant dashing around with wings and legs splayed when feeding has spawned the analogy of an NFL linebacker. And then there's the snowy egret, which takes this activity level down a notch, although it still actively walks and jumps around while chasing small minnows in the shallows. The little blue heron is far less active. In fact, it seems to do everything in slow motion. It walks slowly and deliberately towards a group of fish, takes aim, and then quickly stabs. Then we have the great egret and the great blue herons, which are typical of what we call stand and wait predators. They will often stand dead still for up to several hours in one place, just waiting for something to come their way. It's almost as though they become part of the scenery until an unlucky customer comes in reach of that stabbing bill. These unique examples show how all the white herons and white morphs can be separated based on behavior alone. Feeding behavior at a distance or in bad light can be very revealing in order to distinguish between two closely related or similar species. If I see a pelican spiraling and then crashing into the water head first, I know that this plunge driving behavior can only belong to the brown pelican species. However, if I see a large flock of pelicans corralling fish on a lake in a coordinated fishing foray, then I know, even if the light is terrible and they are far away, that these birds are white pelicans. Some species of raptors use specific feeding techniques that are seldom, if ever, used by other species. If you happen to be in South Florida, for example, in winter, you might see a raptor soaring high amongst a large kettle of vultures. This will more than likely be the rare short-tailed hawk, especially if it's in winter. A raptor which uses vulture kettles as a form of concealment whilst hunting birds. And if you happen to be in Texas and you come across a strange raptor with a crest walking through a field or patrolling the edge of a lagoon on foot, this might well turn out to be the unique crested caracara. Okay, so far we've covered two of our behavioral categories, typical behavior and feeding behavior. Now let's turn to our third, flight behavior. Flight behavior is the single most useful ID tool when trying to identify birds in the air. 
All birds have distinct flight patterns, and learning these can make you look like an absolute pro. Ask yourself these questions. What does the flight look like? Is the flight pattern straight? Is it undulating or bouncy? Are the wing beats fast or are they slow and deliberate? Does the bird hover like a helicopter? Let's now consider a few flight patterns that might be useful for identification purposes. Woodpeckers and some other birds appear to bounce in flight as they alternate flapping with gliding. In woodpeckers, this leads to a swooping or undulating bounce. But in smaller birds like finches, the bouncing is quicker and even jerky. This is caused by the bird actually holding its wings closed for a brief instant and then quickly flitting the wings again. Raptors can pose serious identification challenges. The reason for this are twofold. Many species have several color morphs and age plumages. Raptors also spend much of their time in the air, making a close ID almost impossible. So being able to identify raptors in flight is often the best and often the only way to know what you're looking at. Knowing the flight patterns of different types of raptors can narrow down the ID challenge to just a few species, so that size, shape and color can be supplemented to nail down an ID. Some birds of prey, like falcons and goshawks, fly in a dead straight line, using speed and the element of surprise to catch their prey. Others, like red-tailed hawks and bald eagles, circle and soar. White-tailed kites, kestrels, rough-legged hawks and white-tailed hawks will often hover in the air, remaining in one place with their heads and bodies still, while their rapid wing beats keep them totally stationary. Ospreys plunge dive for fish, sometimes completely submerging themselves in the process. Harriers are well known for coursing low over fields and marshes in a feeding technique known as quartering. And then there are the hummingbirds, which have the ability to hover, dip, and fly backwards like a helicopter. Interesting to note that no other bird can fly backwards. So if you see a small bird backing up in flight and you're sober, you can be 100% sure that it is a hummingbird of sorts. And then there are other bird species that have entirely unique flight patterns. These cannot be confused with any other bird. Remember the spotted sandpiper we described earlier as having a distinctive walk? Well, this bird also has a very peculiar whirring flight with extremely rapid wing beats that is dissimilar to any of the other shorebird species. So, as with the feeding techniques, you can use flight patterns and behavior to narrow down your ID at the macro level and sometimes even nail an ID straight away at the micro level. Whether a bird lives singly or in a flock is a very underestimated but nevertheless important tool, especially for a beginning birder. And this leads me to my next type of behavior, flocking behavior. This is a tendency of certain species of birds to form part of a closely knit group of other birds, mostly but not always of the same species. Think for a moment how likely you are to see a cedar waxwing on its own. Unless it's sick, injured, breeding or very lost, this is highly unlikely. Conversely, how likely are you to encounter a closely knit flock of cardinals? Unless you're watching Arizona play football, this too is very unlikely. Then let's look at a chattering group of small yellow birds at the top of a tree. This is more likely to be a flock of goldfinches than common yellow throats, which live singly or in pairs in small shrubby bushes. These examples show how the tendency of a bird to flock can be quite useful to beginners. And as you become more experienced, knowledge of flocking behavior becomes almost second nature and serves as an excellent aid in making quick and reliable IDs. Just remember, 
that some birds tend to flock more at the end of summer when they gather for migration. Tree swallows are the perfect example, since these wonderful aerialists stay together in close flocks during the winter. During summer, however, they tend to be found much more loosely. So that gives us an overview of four of our categories, typical, feeding, flight, and flocking behaviors. Our final two categories are mating and nesting behaviors. Mating behaviors are not readily used as a tool for identifying birds, but these fascinating displays differ widely from species to species and can make for really interesting birding. Birds tend to use day length and weather changes to tell what season it is. When the number of daylight hours increases above a particular level, certain physiological changes occur in a bird that dictate its time to breed. Most types of birds will make sure that they time their breeding with the seasons, when food will be most abundant for feeding their rapidly growing babies. But well before they contemplate building a nest and raising young, they need to choose a suitable mate and then select a breeding site. Some non-migratory birds will maintain a territory throughout the year and then choose a mate either that they've been with all year or a new one depending on the species. Let's take the mute swan for example, a species introduced from Europe. These birds aggressively defend their territory all year and actually mate for life. Other non-migratory birds will actively select and defend a new territory in the spring and then set about finding a mate. An example is the blue jay, which will wander more widely during non-breeding season and then defend a particular territory starting in the spring. But migratory birds, like many species of warblers, set about maintaining a territory as quickly as possible after their arrival from their wintering grounds. Once a territory has been established, these birds then turn to finding a mate or displaying to an existing one. The females of most species will choose a male based on the prowess of his mating display, his nest building ability, his breeding plumage, and various other display behaviors like dancing or drumming. Males will often bring food to the female to cement the pair bond. Some birds such as albatrosses and swans mate for life, but many male birds choose a mate for only one season. Still others choose several mates in a season in a system known as polygony. And then there are even a precious few bird species in which it is the female that mates with several males in a system called polyandry. A great example of this is the northern jacana, a bird which is common in Mexico and which occasionally makes an appearance in the southern US and is even bred in Texas. So let's look briefly at some of the more interesting mating displays. Watching and understanding mating displays can be one of the most enjoyable and rewarding aspects of birding. Western grebe couples engage in a high energy tandem rushing ceremony where they run at high speed on the water with their necks elongated in perfect synchrony like duetting ice skaters. It truly is one of the most amazing birding spectacles to witness. And then there's the male greater sage grouse, which inflates its air sac, puffs out its neck, and erects its tail feathers and produces a weird popping sound that can be heard by females from miles away. Male prairie chickens gather in large numbers at communal leks or staging grounds. Here they attempt to lure in females by producing an eerie booming sound while strumming their feet energetically on the ground. Sandhill cranes engage in a delightful dance and present each other with gifts. And then we cannot forget the white-collared and red-capped mannequins from Mexico that perform elaborate dances and wing-snapping displays. These are just a few of the incredible mating displays of the birds of North America. But related to mating behavior, is our final category, nesting behavior. 
Nesting can offer a fascinating insight into the private lives of birds. But knowing what birds build what nests can assist in locating and identifying a particular species too. Approximately 700 species of birds breed in North America, and the variances in their behaviors are awe-inspiring and complex at the same time. Birds go about finding mates, building nests, and raising young in surprisingly different ways. Nests are perfectly designed to provide a safe place for birds to raise their young. They are as diverse as the different mating strategies of birds. Some nests are a simple scrape in the ground, some are elaborate structures composed of lichen, grasses, and other materials. Others are massive stick structures that are heavy enough to break the bough of a large tree. Nests can be found just about anywhere, from beaches, to buildings, to cavities in trees, to bridges, to caves, and many more. So let's explore some of the most common types of nesting behavior and see how nests themselves can give away useful clues as to the presence of a certain bird species. When most people think of a bird's nest, I bet they would describe a simple cup-shaped structure built of some kind of vegetation and other material. This is pretty accurate as it is the most common type of nest. Cup structures made out of grass, reeds or other delicate materials are commonly used by many species of passerines. With some variation, this is the typical nest of sparrows, warblers, vireos, robins, thrushes, cardinals and more. In order to successfully identify a nest, observe it from a distance first and see if there's any activity. And remember that many female birds look very different from males and can often be harder to identify. Take notes so that you can try and identify the bird later in your field guide. Also take note of what time of year it is. Resident birds tend to breed in late winter and early spring. Migratory species tend to nest in early summer. This is because it takes them a little time to settle into their new home after their exhausting migration. For example, a pygmy nuthatch in California will nest in March, whereas many of the returning warbler species will nest in May or June. And remember that migratory birds tend to nest earlier in the south than in the northern states due to the warmer climate. And of course you'll want to take notes on the nest itself. Is it on the ground or is it high up in a tree? What materials are used? Is there a lining in the nest? Has spider web or mud been used to bind it together? Is there any lichen or moss attached to the side of the nest for concealment purposes? What is the shape of the nest? Is it simple or is it more complex? If there are eggs inside, take careful note of the color, size and shape of the eggs. The size of an egg is proportionate to the size of the bird. Pointy eggs tend to belong to birds that nest in shallow scrapes in the ground or on the edges of cliffs. Birds like terns and shorebirds, for example. The reason for this is that the eggs are harder for them to roll out of the scrape when they're pointy. But remember, always be as quick as possible around an active nest and never touch or move the nest. Once you have taken notes on the nest you're observing, you can turn to field guides and other resources for help in reaching a positive identification. But here are a few examples of nests to get you started. Most pigeons and doves build very rudimentary nests of sticks in the forks of trees. Large raptors like eagles build massive stick platforms, most often right at the top of trees. Orioles actually weave a nest. It is like an elongated pouch with an opening on the top. Vireos usually build a nest between two sticks of a branch and the nest hangs down below the fork. Some species, like chickadees, wrens, bluebirds and nuthatches, will build a nest inside a cavity of a tree. Phoebes and swallows build complicated nests out of mud and feathers that hang under a bridge 
rock ledge, or under the eaves of a house. This just scratches the surface of the many types of nests you'll find in North America. The variety is truly remarkable, which presents us birders with a lifetime of opportunities to compare, contrast, and discover something new. And with that, we've reached the end of our lecture on using bird behavior as an advanced birding tool. In covering the six core types of bird behavior, we've developed some tools that will help you navigate the rich diversity of America's bird species. Now it's up to you to put these tools to use. So get out there and train your eyes. Who knows, maybe soon your friends, like mine, will be marveling at your ability to turn subtle quirks of behavior into a confident identification.